I wanted to thank, obviously, Dario and the local organizers for allowing us to put this in the program, and I'm really excited to be debating Allison, whose work I've followed and I respect, and so I think it's an exciting opportunity and a great place and a great venue to do it. So I've been asked to, or I've asked myself, I guess, to answer the question, <laughs> no. <laughs> So I do have conflicts of interest, so put your filter on, different than, than Allison. I have a lot, and I've been trained by David Jenkins, so I put everything up from intellectual to financial to familial, and you'll find all of those there uh, as it relates to guidelines, to uh, sponsorship, uh, some of our research, and my wife, which is my most important conflict of interest. As I always say, I share a pillow with industry. <clears throat> So what I'm not debating, I thought I would start with that. Um, and I think, you know, it was, it's, we didn't actually, we did discuss this beforehand and I think it was useful, but I think we, on our own, uh, came to sort of two different approaches that worked out really well. So Allison did a great job reviewing the animal data. And so really that's not what I'm gonna get into. So first and foremost, I'm not gonna debate the safety of low calorie sweeteners. I think that question's been asked and answered certainly by the FDA and EFSA and Health Canada and other authorities as it relates to toxicological concerns. Um, I'm not also going to debate the issue of the various low calorie sweeteners can actually reach the colon. Now, as Allison showed you, that really nice paper by Berna Magnuson that reviewed the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Um, ACE-K and saccharin don't, and really probably quantitative amounts, get to the colon, although they can, but certainly sucrose does and, st and stevia do, so they can reach the colon. And so I think there's biological plausibility that they may be able to alter uh, and have impact on microbiome and microbiota. So I'm not gonna debate those issues. And I don't wanna review the animal data, which Allison did such a great job looking at uh, in terms of its ability to whether it can induce dysbiosis or not in animals and whether it can in uh, induce glucose uh, intolerance. You know, I think the far more relevant question, and I, and I think that Allison touched on that really is not whether they work through microbiome. I think the first question should really be, do they actually have uh, an impact on glucose tolerance and diabetes risk? So really on the patient important public health important outcomes and their intermediate surrogates, do we actually see an impact there? And then if we do, then we can ask the question, well, how might that be the case? But let's ask the question first, how does it relate to um, public, you know, really things of, of public health concern and, and clinical concern? So how did we get here? So I think um, Allison touched on this. I mean, this, this, this field is, is sort of 10 years old as it relates to low calorie sweeteners and, and microbiome, as, as she nicely showed. But I think we really got here because of that Suez paper in nature, because of course, if it's in nature, it must be true. And this generated a tremendous amount of very vigorous uh, media response. And, and, and uh, certainly the patients that came to me all were talking about this um, really as a result of, of this paper. Now this paper had a number of serious limitations, certainly as it relates to the human data. And, and Allison touched on those, but I just, Al, and Allison went really into a lot of the details, so I, I'm going to just probably just summarize, but I want to start first with a lot of limitations. The first one is they only assessed saccharin as the prototypical low calorie sweetener in humans. So they did look at sucralose and aspartame, but once they identified that the most robust response was to saccharin, that became the prototypical typical sweetener, and yet they drew all their conclusions as it related to all uh, low calorie sweeteners. Uh, the second was there was no control group. This was a before after uh, study design. So we don't know whether there were things about the conditions of the experimental conditions that might have resulted in the changes. And a really important one, and we had this discussion last night, is they did an oral glucose tolerance test every day for seven days. So when you divide your data into responders, non-responders, is it because the responders are people that just respond to glucose, having an oral glucose tolerance test every day, maybe they're particularly carbohydrate sensitive, or is it really because they got the sweeteners? And not having a control group doesn't really allow us to answer that question, uh, not to mention a number of other possible uh, confounders. There was uh, this post hoc separation into responders and non-responders, which I think any of you, all great scientists, if you were to do that, you'd probably get booted right out of the journal you were submitting to if you're going to draw, draw strong conclusions by taking seven people and saying, oh, that four looks like they're going that way and that three going that way, and we'll call them responders and non-responders. Four, they only assessed extreme doses at the max ADI, which is really, and Allison touched on this, not probably a place most people are consuming, uh, certainly as it relates to saccharin, uh, especially because saccharin's not really contained in any low calorie sweetened beverages with the exception of TAB, I, I think. So, and it's really just in, in sweetener packets. You'd have to have quite a few. And I think the intended pattern of use wasn't really looked at, which is the displacement of excess calories from sugars really wasn't assessed to see um, is there an advantage under those circumstances. It was really just looking at it um, in and of itself. <clears throat> so let's see if I can change the slide. So this is the data, and Allison showed this to you, and I don't want to go through too much of it, but just quickly that there was the cross-sectional analysis where they showed that the high NAS consumers, of which there was 40, had a higher HbA1c than the lower ones, and then there was correlations um, as it related to, to microbiome. We had the human study, which was the one component of this analysis, 
Um, here's the responders, and this is again, they've done every day for four days, first four days, this is their glucose tolerance test, and this is after days five to seven in the responders versus the non-responders. Um, and you see this difference, again, not a controlled comparison and when dividing the data. Um, they then, in looking at those responders and non-responders, looked at, to see um, how that related to microbiome changes using uh, 16S RNA -se sequencing. So this is the uh, principal coordinate analysis using the weighted unifrac distances, and you can see a different pattern um, in the responders in red here versus the non-responders, and then looking at relative abundance of different taxa, you see it's pretty stable in the non-responders, and you see this change in the responders, and they suggested that that really is what was explaining um, this effect. But to really, um, to go a step further, uh, to prove the point, and, you know, and this is an elegant design, they transplanted the feces then from these responders, who again, maybe just particularly carbohydrate sensitive and getting seven days of oral glucose tolerance tests happened to have a higher response into um, the germ-free mice. And you could see in the, in the case of just one responder, a prototypical responder, you get this uh, a pattern that looks the same in these mice versus the non-responders that look like the non-responder humans. Um, so that's the data um, there. I, and I, as I said, this generated a lot of, of interest and it's been invoked by a, a lot of uh, investigators in going forward with this. And I just wanna show this because I think this has taken it to the next step, which is really one, raising the concern of this a metabolic, um, potential metabolic effect. Um, and then the second point that's really been sort of uh, leapfrogged off of that is that it may, they may not deliver the intended benefits as a result of that. And that came really out of a, a Canadian group, so a fellow Canadian group at the University of Manitoba, Megan Azad uh, and her group, they did a systematic review meta-analysis in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that garnered a tremendous number, amount of attention. I think the alt metric factor on this one is one of the highest for the journal that they've had. Um, we, we actually um, applauded them. It was an excellent systematic review meta-analysis in terms of the methodology. We just raised some concerns in this letter, and I'll get into it a little bit better, uh, a little bit more, uh, that it, uh, as we go further along, uh, that really they overlooked really, we think, really important methodological concerns, one of the most important of which is really the nature of the comparator. And so we'll, I'll address that. And so with that, um, you know, what are health authorities saying? Well, not necessarily directly responding to these particular papers, um, they, they really, but, but certainly addressing the concern, a number of, of health authorities through guidelines have uh, issued guidance and recommendations as it relates to low calorie sweetened beverages. So the Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee, this is the report, uh, recommended a reduction in added sugars as we've heard uh, at this meeting and, and an upper threshold of 10%. But what they recommended was that the low calorie sweetened beverages not be used for the replacement um, of the of added sugars, that rather healthy options such as water, and I don't think there's any debate in the room that water is the gold standard, and we should be recommending water. That's the preferred replacement, but it's going a step further to say that we, we should not be replacing um, sugar sweetened beverages or sugars with low calorie sweeteners. If we look at what the diabetes associations are saying, and I think that's most relevant to this meeting because we're asking the question as it relates to glucose tolerance and diabetes control. We have, do have guidance from the American Diabetes Diabetes Canada. Um, Diabetes UK, uh, we don't actually, uh, we've not issued any, uh, maybe we'll change that with our new guidelines as we move forward. As Jim says, they're terribly antiquated and we do need to update them. And um, the IDF has it. But if we look at the others, really they, the recommendation is that they uh, can be part of a diabetes diet, uh, especially really uh, where they're used to displace excess calories from sugars, that they are a tool to be placed in the toolbox and they can be considered. Um, and in Diabetes Canada, we certainly address some of the concerns, uh, which I'll get into with the data, uh, but still recommended that they uh, could be used. So then, what is the evidence uh, with that background? So um, this is our, our revision of the um, sort of evidence framework, if you like, and I think we do need to invoke an evidence-based framework, the same one we would use to advise clinical practice guidelines and public health policy. Uh, a new thinking, rethinking of it, and there's actually, a, there was a paper from the Mayo Clinic group that suggested the same thing, and we've done this separately, but we agree, um, that really, the, 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 if you look at the pyramid, this really reflects the units of analysis and the, the decreasing bias that one gets as one goes to RCTs. Um, and the systematic review and analysis process is separate from that. That's just the best tools we have to pool and synthesize that evidence and apply a framework such as GRADE, for example, as an approach to um, rate and grade that evidence. But where RCTs give us the best protection against bias because they allow for the randomization or equal allocation, if you like, or balanced alloc allocation of, of prognostic factors between the, uh, the intervention and the, and the control group. 
um, so that uh, eliminating the uh, issue of residual confounding where randomization is balanced. And then the best observational studies which we use to inform public health policy, which really starts here on the pyramid, which is prospective cohort studies, which are important in nutrition because they generally give good assessments of the exposures. They have uh, good assessments of important confounders and those that we know about so we can make those adjustments. But really more importantly, long longitudinal follow-up so we can really ask questions about really important, uh, like public health important, patient important outcomes like incidence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and, and cardiovascular mortality. So what if we look at those and we, we, we go start at the cohorts and, and go to the trials and ask the question, do these, uh, do low calorie sweeteners actually have an impact on really patient important, public health important outcomes and, and their surrogate biomarkers independent, sort of putting aside the, the question of, of microbiome. So we look at the cohort studies, there's been an, a number of uh, really good systematic reviews and meta-analyses have looked at these from weight change through to cardiovascular disease. I don't have time to go through all of them, so I'm just going to go through the ones in solid blue, but suffice it to say that all of these uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses have shown a signal. And the irony is that it's a very similar signal to what you actually see with sugar-sweetened beverages in terms of the weight gain, the metabolic syndrome risk, diabetes risk, the relative risks and their comps intervals overlap with that for sugar-sweetened beverages. But let's go through each one in turn. Um, what I, would, what I would say too, uh, you know, and just summar you know, sort of summarizing this is that what the individual systematic review meta-analysis groups that have done this, the guidelines group that have used those, and also the uh, authors and investigators that have done the prospective cohorts, which are the units of analysis, all say is that this data is at very high risk for residual confounding, um, and in particular for reverse causality. And the reason is it's not that low calorie sweetened beverages, or sorry, yes, low calorie sweetened beverages cause diabetes, it's that, or cardiovascular disease, it's because you're at risk for those that causes you to consume them, in that you're doing it as a preventative strategy and you're at higher risk, and that may explain the signal. And, and all of the authors, I have to give credit uh, to have, have pointed out that these data are very high risk for residual uh, confounding from reverse causality. So if we look here, this is the Azad paper uh, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which shows an increase, whoops, pardon me, in uh, weight when you compare the highest level of exposure to the lowest level of exposure uh, for low calorie uh, sweeteners. Um, one thing I'd say is there, there's a few caveats. There's the reverse causality issue. Um, the other issue here that, you know, it's kind of come up and been brought to my attention in chatting with the Harvard group and looking at data, these data that they took here for the three Harvard cohorts, these are baseline data. If you look at the change data, there is no association. This is baseline data. So the change data in cohorts tends to uh, uh, deal with and handle a lot of that reverse causality. If you use baseline data, then you tend to see some of these associations. So I will show you later, if you look at the Harvard data, looking at change data, actually you see what you'd expect, which is weight loss. Uh, using uh, low calorie sweetened beverages, for example. So, but based on their analysis and, and selecting the baseline data, not the change data, they did show an association with weight gain. If we look, there's a bit of a lag here. There we go. If we look at the diabetes risk, um, I've selected a few different systematic reviews to give a bit of variety, but they, they come to similar conclusions. This is the Imamura paper in the BMJ. It was published uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is the most adjusted model over here. Sorry if you can. I don't think the pointer's working very well, but it's, it's on your far um, right. Uh, what you can see is, again, a relative risk in comps intervals that looks a lot like you would see for sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, but these data, again, are at high risk of reverse causality. There was a lot of inconsistency. The I squared's quite high, as you will see. And there was imprecision also in the estimates. Um, as well, um, and another reason you would downgrade this evidence is there was evidence of publication bias. So although they did not uh, find evidence using um, Egger and Bag and inspection of funnel plots, when they did their trim and fill analysis and adjusted for it, it lost significance. So it suggests that there may be an element of publication bias, and that may relate to using change data versus baseline data again, because if you look at the Harvard cohorts, which are, uh, you can see here, Nurses Health 1, 2, and Health Professionals, you see you don't see significant associations in those uh, cohorts, and those are very large, well-powered cohorts. If we look at the uh, cardiovascular risk question, so I'll go back to the Azad paper, um, comparing the highest level of exposure to the lowest level of exposure. Uh, we don't have a lot of cohorts, but what we do have, you do see an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and an increased risk for stroke. But again, with all of these high risk reverse causality, and in these estimates in particular, there's imprecision and inconsistency, or sorry, indirectness. So how do low calorie student beverages compare with water? And I think that's a really important question since that is the gold standard replacement, the preferred replacement. We only have really one study in terms of the observational cohorts, prospective cohorts that have looked at it, but I think it's, it's quite telling. So this is a pooled analysis of the three Harvard cohorts, Nurses Health Study 1, 
two and the health professional study. We got 20 years of follow-up each in nurses' health study one and the health professionals and, and 16 years of follow-up in nurses' health studies two. So a lot of follow-up in almost 125,000 individuals. And what you can see here when you look at uh, the most adjusted, multivariate adjusted model for water, both are associated with weight loss. And it's a very similar estimate with confidence intervals that overlap. So we're looking at something similar to what you would see um, with water. And I think that's the expected. Now, what if we look at the, um, the higher quality evidence, certainly in terms of design, but now looking at intermediate or surrogate biomarkers as opposed to um, actual events? So if we look at the controlled feeding trials, if we look first at body weight, so this is the um, Azad paper again, um, and they did not show uh, an adverse effect, um, certainly on body weight in the trials, but they suggested that, um, that the low-calorie sweeteners here really give, all given as beverages did not liver, deliver the intended benefit uh, or the intended weight loss that one would expect. Now, we did critique this, and I think it's, um, it's, it's relevant, and I think people that are working in nutrition um, you know, certainly would appreciate, and I think a content, that content expertise would have been useful on certainly in their authorship group, is that it didn't really take into account the nature of the comparator. So we have these um, five um, study comparisons uh, from uh, seven RCTs, and what you can see here is across the seven for these, for, uh, in all cases, it was not the intended pattern of use. The low-calorie sweetened beverages were not being used to displace excess calories from sugar-sweetened beverages. The, they were actually, because of their eligibility criteria, and it was not meant, I don't think, to, 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 to set this up to have this effect, but because of it, they were looking at only six-month studies. They ended up getting a number of placebo studies because these were the safety studies that were done where it's just given in capsule form versus uh, a placebo capsule where you're not expecting it to have certainly intended benefit. Four of the seven studies was versus water, where you wouldn't expect, again, the intended benefit because you're not displacing excess calories from sugars. And one of the seven was with the matched weight loss diet. So what we argued is the design did not allow for the displacement of excess calories. So you would not reasonably expect to see any weight loss. So it's not that they didn't have the intended benefit. They actually had the effect you would precisely predict, which is if you're not displacing calories, then you're likely not to have any effect that's much different. And that's, I think, reflected in, in their data. <clears throat> And in fact, if you look at the one study that they did include, which was the Maersk trial, um, which I will show some data from here, um, where they do have a comparison with sugar-sweetened beverages, they didn't use that comparison. They used the comparison with water. But if you use the sugar-sweetened beverage comparison, then you do see improvements in, in some of the weight uh, outcomes from that study. So if we look uh, then at another, other systematic reviews, which have more inclusive eligibility criteria, because they also allowed for studies of of shorter duration, where you do get the displacement um, of calories, then you do, I think, get the intended benefit. And this is in adults, and this is in children with the DeRoyter trial, and this is the overall estimate. You do see the weight loss that you would predict if you're going to displace uh, calories from sugars. <clears throat> What about glycemic control and cardiometabolic risk factors? So this is the Maersk trial I was talking about. This is a trial that was done in Denmark by Arne Astrup and his group. I'm not sure if Anne, you were part of this too. I, I, maybe partially, okay. She'll probably talk a bit about in her, in her talk. Uh, but this is, I just put in um, those that were significant and in blue here I put the glycemic control parameters as those are really relevant to the discussion. So they actually saw a reduction in triglycerides and a reduction in cholesterol. And you might predict that certainly from displacing calories from sugar-sweetened beverages, you'd get the reduction in triglycerides. And they didn't see any adverse effect on um, these parameters of, of glycemic control. And in fact, they, they went in the right direction in terms of the, um, the, the effect that you would expect. Um, you can see negatives here in all cases for the diet cola in terms of those going down. <clears throat> Uh, if you look at the, I think what is one of the best design trials, and I'm sorry the, the reference fell off, um, which is the De Reuter, um, uh, the drink trial by uh, De Reuter et al., by Martin Catan's group. This was a really important study that was done in, in 641 individuals and kids, 4 to 12 years old, with 18 months of follow-up. And this is in their um, imputed data. So this is in the intention to treat, and then this is in the completers analysis. You can see an improvement in waist circumference. They didn't have any other... Um, of the biomarkers or cardiometabolic risk factors, but you did see the improvement in waste. And this is the Maersk trial again showing an improvement in liver fat um, and, a, and a tendency for an improvement in, in visceral adipose tissue and ectopic fat. If we look at the Maersk trial, you also see an improvement in blood pressure. So you're seeing the improvement, okay, three minutes, so I'm, I'm wrapping. Um, and this is actually a study done by Anne, and I'm sure she'll show, which I think is an important study, an earlier Danish trial, if you like, a smaller study, they showed improvements in blood pressure 
uh, similar to that that was seen here with the, the Maris trial. So we do see improvements um, in weight outcomes and those cardiometabolic risk factors that would flow from those changes. So I do, I do think you see the intended benefit from displacing calories. Now what about water? And again, I think this is a really relevant comparison, but really where you wouldn't expect to see a difference, what do we see? And we, we had some of these these data presented to us today. Um, I'm going to show you very quickly because um, Lily's going to show it afterwards as one of the oral abstracts, but because I have to bring everything to bear, I, I will show it. But I'll start first um, with Peter Rogers' analysis. This was an earlier analysis done as part of his really excellent systematic review analysis showing actually you do not see an adverse effect compared to water. In fact, you see that uh, the low calorie sweet beverages did better uh, in ter uh, than the water in terms of, of weight. Um, when we've done this, and this is Lily's data, and I don't, I don't want to steal her thunder, but she'll go through the methods. This is the direct comparison, then we did a network comparison. You actually see the intended benefit here of weight loss compared to sugar-sweetened beverages, and you see that it's no different than, um, sorry, than water. If you look here at NSBs versus water, you see that it's no different. It actually favors a bit uh, the direction of, of the um, low-calorie sweetened beverages. Glycemic control and cardiometabolic risk. So NEMA presented this to you before as a short oral abstract. So you've already seen these data. We did see a reduction in HDL cholesterol, but looking across these other 15 endpoints, no, no real differences. And it's questionable whether we'll see that in the network meta-analysis and how important a change in HDL cholesterol is, as we see that with a lot of different interventions, and it's not clear whether that really matters. But across most of these, we're not seeing any signal for harm that it's any worse than water if we take water as the gold standard comparator. So what are the conclusions? Uh, as I wrap up it now. Um, so the question, I think, again, just to reframe it, I think is not really whether low-calorie sweetened beverages induce glucose intolerance through the microbiome. I think the question, really full stop, is do they actually have uh, induced glucose intolerance and have an effect on the patient-important outcomes? And if they do, then I think we can ask the question quite fairly, how do, they, how do they do that? And then we could invoke mechanisms like microbiome and investigate that. But really, I think the question is about glucose intolerance and, and, the, and that the flows from it. And careful consideration of those studies, I think, suggests otherwise. I don't know if it's a categorical no, but I think it suggests otherwise. Although there are concerns from cohorts to support the contention that low-calorie seat and beverages may increase the risk of obesity and diabetes, I think if we, uh, and their downstream complications, the associations are at high risk reverse causality. If we look at the higher quality data for randomized control trials, better protection against bias, and we've reviewed this with the guidelines and come to this conclusion, then we actually don't see um, any adverse effects. We actually see the intended benefit. Uh, comparisons with water show similar, and I think that's really the preferred uh, recommended replacement, show similar effects, which is, I think, an important comparison to make. But to address the uncertainties, so uh, I, I do want money for more studies, as, as, uh, as I've said, then yes, I think we do need more trials. And I'm just going to show quickly, this is a trial that we've got funded through the Canadian Institute of Health Research in 75 individuals, multiple crossover study, where we, our two primary endpoints are glucose tolerance and microbiome. So this is really a priority area uh, where we'll try to answer that question. And I hope to be able to come back or one of the students to come back and present that to you on another meeting. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thanks to the study group.